It is Wednesday afternoon, February 28th. Don't turn your calendar. You've got one more day in February this year, but we'll be picking up in uh, Bereshit, Genesis chapter 35 and verse 14. But just before we do, very close to the end of last class, we were talking about Bethel, Beit El, the house of God, and El Beit El, the, the God of the house of God. This was where Jacob is coming back. He's really finally coming home. It might be when God really finally considered that he had fully been obedient. He had come back to the place where God had appeared to him, the ladder, the dream of the ladder and all. I was asked at the end of class what uh, Bethel is like today. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, I love to research, I love to go find out, and now I want to go back to Israel and go visit. <laughs> because they have found some very interesting things. Today, the common name that the, the village, the area is known <coughs> by is Beitim. B-E-I-T-I-M. That's the name that they give it. Beit, I still see house. Im, I'd have to research what that means in the Hebrew. It's not im, which is plural for God. Or plural period I'm sorry but it, maybe it's still a form of that maybe it's plural for houses I don't know but anyway sometimes on some of the maps if they're not good with the Hebrew and you're looking at a map that's not you'll it'll spell it B A Y T I M I say that just in case if you go look for it uh, let me show you Roger bring up map number one you'll do it again later probably but just do it real quick just to show you it's still in the same area they're saying that the original Beit El, Bethel, is real close to what today is called Beit In. So, is that map number one? There's Beit El right there. It is, yeah, there you go. Okay. Now, it, just to get your bearings real quick, because you're not seeing all of the land of Israel, but looking at this map, it's almost in the middle where it says Beit El. Notice, good, good, whoa, freeze, <laughs> thank you. Notice that Jerusalem is south of it, okay? It's about 10 miles above Jerusalem. You're in the area of Samaria, okay? That's why you see the star says Samaria, because you're in the area of Samaria. The body of water that you're seeing, um, well, actually, that, I don't want to confuse you, but the, the, the little white line is the Jordan River. You're going to go down to the Dead Sea. Above this map is Galilee. So you're south of Galilee in the Samaria area, which is a little wider than Judea. You know, you have Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost, okay? So that just helps you zero in where you are. Again, it's, it's still about 10 miles north of Jerusalem. It's in the hill country, again, um, in biblical time, known as the hill country of Samaria. It's about a half hour drive from Jerusalem because you're going through hills. You're not just going freeway lickety split. Mm -hmm. um, it is West Bank territory. Um, I think, go ahead and do it. We're again, we'll repeat these maps, but go ahead and go to map number two, I think it is. I gave him three today, um, but I think it's map number two. I want you to see what we call the West Bank area. Yes, okay. You saw all the rest, but see how Samaria is still named in Jerusalem for you. So you know south of the name Samaria, north, whoa, 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 don't hide it, don't hide it. Okay, freeze. Okay. <laughs> north of Jerusalem and south of Samaria, right between the two is where Bethel is. That whole area that's kind of, um, what am I going to call it? It, it? The hand right now is on gold then we'll call it a washed out orange okay that washed out area that's the west bank today it's called that because it's the west side of the jordan river but it doesn't mean it's just you know real narrow it goes into the hill country you know it's that whole area you can see how it touches jerusalem remember they want east jerusalem to be part of of their territory god forbid uh, personal opinion, but biblical also, I believe. Anyway, that gives you your bearing there. Um, when you hear Ramallah mentioned in the news, Ramallah is big because it's a headquarters for the um, Palestinian authority. network authority. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's 3.1 miles from Ramallah to Beit El. Okay? okay. A bomb Ramallah, and that would take away all the... Um... If Ramallah was bombed, Israel would be hurt. Okay. It's, it's 
So you, unless you have a real concise and it holds everything in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, I really wouldn't want to see it happen that way because the collateral damage would go out into um, too much uh, area of uh, population, um, you know, where a lot of people are. Mm -hmm. But uh, in, in 1977, they gave it the biblical name Beit El. Um, for for baked in, you know, so it depends on who you're talking to, but I gave you the name that if you're dealing outside of the Bible, that's what they're calling it today. Mm -hmm. But they did find here um, uh, several, uh, I have to get back to what they found. Let me give you the description first. Mm -hmm. During Bible times, and remember we're studying this, this is where Jacob is now, you know, where we're picking up today. It stood at the main crossroads in Israel. It was the main north-south road that passed through the central hill country, Samaria, that went down south to Hebron, Hebron. It was also the main east-west from Jericho, which is close to Jerusalem, and all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. So it was like the main thoroughfare and the crossroads of it, so it was a very important area. Um, Okay, it was where Abraham and Jacob pitched their tents and erected altars. And that's the area that they think they have actually discovered. Remains that they can tell that there was tents there. Um, it must have been like where the tent pegs would go down. I, I don't know. I haven't gotten to study it all yet, but like I say, now it's on my radar to want to go see. <laughs> um, it's one of the highest places in Israel. It's 2,900 feet above sea level. Uh, because of that, it was a place of worship for both God and in time for the false gods. It, it is believed that the tabernacle was there for some time during the period of the judges and that Jeroboam, who took over the king when the, the, the uh, country was divided, you had your north and your south, when Jeroboam was one of the, the kings, he set up a golden calf altar here. It's under the kingdom of divided Israel is how they put it. I think that's probably all I need to say at this point. But again, they've got ruins where they think they, they pitched their tents and built their altars. They probably found, in fact, I saw one quick picture that would have been the remains of, a, of an ancient altar from that time. Uh, they said once ex excavated, it revealed walls and buildings and remains of ancient Beth El. Beth El. So very, very interesting. Like I say, if I get to go back, it's on my radar to go visit. I would love to see that. So thank you for asking the question. There's your answer. Today, it, there's a little village, you know, that's that, an Israeli settlement that's right near the actual findings of it. Okay, and that's what's called Beit Im on your map. So there's that question answered from the end of class. And then... My correction, I always am open to being corrected. I want to teach accurately, and I pray for that all the time, but I am human, sorry, <laughs> but woefully aware of how human I am. We all are. We, and this is right where we're coming in for today. When you look at, at bear sheet, Genesis 35, and you look at verse 14, we were talking about Yaakov set up a memorial stone in the place where he had spoken with him, where he had spoken with God. God appeared to him again. Remember, that was verse 9. That uh, We don't read of God appearing to Jacob at Shechem. We know he built an altar to God there. But we read of God appearing to Jacob at Baal when he was going out and 30 years later when he's back to Baal. He reminds him that his name is Israel, that he's God Almighty, that kings are going to come from him, the land that he gave to his grandfather and his father Abraham and Isaac, he's giving to him and to his descendants. It's no longer just to one person, it will go to Jacob's sons. Okay, that's where then God um, went up. It shows that, that God was there in person with Yaakov. It was not a vision, it wasn't a dream, it was live. Um, Roger, if you can get me back to my people instead of the map, it'll help me have eye contact with them. No, I'm communicating. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so this is where Jacob set up a memorial stone again in the place where God had spoken with him. And then he poured out a drink offering on it. Um, it, said, it says that he also poured oil on it. And he named the place where God had spoken with him, Baal, just with the renaming again. This is the house of God. 
Now, last class, I was asked the question, is this what David did when he poured out the water? Was that like a drink offering? And I said, no, because I knew that the men had gotten it for David under great, um, yes. uh, they could have lost their lives under great danger. I'll just put it that way. So I wasn't thinking in terms of that. But when I went and read and looked it up, and it's in 2 Samuel, I didn't put down the chapter. I want to say it was in chapter 23. I can get the chapter later for you if you need it. But it was, he took it like a drink offering. I also said that I thought the drink offering was optional, that it was a free will, and I stand corrected in that. I'm still not sure what my brain was trying to remember there, but very often, along with other sacrifices, they would make the sacrifice of the animal, and then it would be followed with, with a wine drink offering, a pouring out of wine. Sometimes it's something else, but it always, always was a picture of Messiah being poured out. His blood being poured out for our salvation, for the satisfaction of our holy God. So the sacrifice in their minds wasn't complete till they poured out the drink offering. In other words, you know, they see that the animal lost its life, but they're seeing the pouring out of the of the life also symbolically by the wine. Wine it comes from the oil. Oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit in it. But anyway, it was not a free will offering. It was, they were told, you know, make this sacrifice, the burnt offering, whatever it was, and follow it with the drink offering. In 2 Samuel, when David's men, they were hiding out um, from the enemy at this point, and I'm trying to think who was their enemy. And I don't see that I put it down. Anyway, Philistines. It was the Philistines. I think it's 2 Samuel 23. I've got to look that up. But I think it was chapter 23. If anybody's good at Googling and listening, just you know, type in um, water for David from David from his men during war or something like that, and it'll come up with the scripture for you, and then you can tell us. But uh, definitely 2 Samuel. Three of his men overheard David when he was hiding. They were hiding in caves. They were hiding because uh, the, the enemy was, was so strong. The enemy had a stronghold all the way down around Bethlehem. They were in the hills above. And three of the men heard it. They so loved David that they decided to sneak out, go behind enemy lines, sneak right past the garrison of the Philistines near Bethlehem to where the, the well was near the gate. David was just saying he would, you know, I, I just long to be refreshed by the water from that well. He probably was hot, tired, you know, discouraged and all the rest. It was just a comment. But these men took it to heart. They took a chance. They went and they managed to get water and they managed to get back safely. Thank God. But when David saw the gift that they brought him and he knew it was at the expense of their lives that they could have lost their lives doing it, he felt like that was such a foolish indulgence for him to say that and his men to act on it. He never commanded it. He never expected them to. But still, he realized, you know, he shouldn't have even made a comment like that because if it caused them to go put their life in danger, he just felt like that's terrible. And he thought, I can't refresh myself with this. I'm going to deny myself this, but rather than just denying it and being a waste that they did it for nothing then, and that he didn't want them to think he didn't appreciate, he instead said, I'm going to take what would refresh me, what would be a blessing to me, what my men cared so much to bring to me, but I'm going to offer it to my God. And so he did pour it out as a drink offering to his God, rather than it be his indulging himself he is selfishly getting this, this wonderful water. He instead wanted to give it to, um, to his God. And he compared the risking of their lives to the soul. Because the soul, <clears throat> the, the blood, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Mm -hmm. That's what God's put on the altar for us is, is his blood and the, the body of Yeshua. So to him, it was... If he had drunk it, it'd be like drinking their blood instead of seeing it poured out in sacrifice. So he poured it out in sacrifice and offered it to God. And, and I think that was a of, of the oil? And where did it come from? The water came from the well that was near Bethlehem that David had commented he wished he could go get a drink from. Yeah, I know, but you said something about uh, 
The wine and the oil. Oh, that that sometimes in those drink offerings, it's wine, and sometimes it's uh, oil that's poured out. You you see different things that are poured out. When it's called drink, I think it's only wine or water. But they also have a pouring out of oil. So you just have to read what sacrifice you're doing and what God's commanding. Um, but it all will be symbolic of either the life or um, the Holy Spirit. Either the blood being poured out, which is Yeshua, or the Holy Spirit when it's oil. We see a picture of the Holy Spirit in, in that. Because the oil that fed the lampstand was symbolic of the Holy Spirit. You know, keeps the light continually burning. So, Okay. 2 Samuel 23, 15. Thank you. It is 2 Samuel 23. And it starts with verse 15, Roger right. saying. Okay, so 2 Samuel 23. Okay. So, thank you, Anne, for good insight, picking up that detail, bringing it in living color to us, letting me get corrected so I teach it right. Thank you, Lord. I hope. I trust. <laughs> I don't know how many times around the, his feet up there in heaven I may have to say, well, guys... We tried. I tried. <laughs> because I know, you know, like I say, as hard as I try to get it 100% accurate, I just pray. I, I often ask the Lord, and you hear me, if I don't speak it correctly, let them hear it correctly. Because I know the Holy Spirit is bringing it into your heart and your mind. Uh, but I can't guarantee you when we touch on doctrine, we know. We have no question marks there. <laughs> we know. We know that we know that we know. Salvation in Yeshua Jesus and his blood only, even my shirt. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Which draws me right back to the tabernacle, which we're studying in our parasha, which you might want to see in living color. I'll put in the plug in Oceanside in the month of March. Go Google Tabernacle Alive, Oceanside. You'll find the details. The Bible is a constant learning experience. The Bible is a constant learning experience. It is called B-I-B-L-E. Basic instructions before leaving Earth. So, so if you don't know it, you can't leave Earth. Oh, man. <laughs> no, 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 no. If you don't know the way, you can't leave Earth. <laughs> okay, so picking up at verse 14 then, he, um, that's going to say David. Now I'm in David. <laughs> Jacob, Jacob poured out the, the drink offering. He also poured out oil. So the drink offering here would have been water. He also poured out oil. He's doing everything he can to consecrate it, to make it a memorial, to make it a special altar to God and giving it that name again, the, the house of God. When he saw the ladder here, he felt like he, this was the actual opening right into heaven, that this was the gate to heaven. So look at the gate opening at the house of heaven for us. And when Shaul Paul referred to uh, being like pouring out his life, he compared that also to being like the drink offering. I believe that was, and let's go to it. We looked last week hurriedly, or actually two weeks ago, because um, we didn't have class last week for anybody who were, was looking for that. I meant to mention that earlier too. Philippians 2 and verse 17. And here we have Shaul Paul's words. But even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. So Paul, Shaul Paul, he counted it a blessing, a joy. If his whole life, if he was pouring out his lifeblood as a sacrifice to bring salvation to his, those who were hearing from him, that was his blessing. He also refers to this in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And verse 6, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6, where we read, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. And he was right. We're going to see Isaac was way off base. When he thought he was dying, he lived many years past. But for um, Shaul Paul, it was not you know that many years before he did um, sacrificially... Um, Give his life up for the Lord. He was he was martyred. That's the word I wanted. He was martyred for the Lord. Sorry, I uh, dropped my chain of thought for a moment. Um, when it talks about, if you go look up the drink offering, and I gave scriptures last time, but again, is Numbers chapter 15, start with verse 5. 
Um, you can read 5 through 10, but especially 5 through 7 and 9 and 10 are, are giving you details. You'll also read of the drink offerings in Shemot in Exodus chapter 29, verses 40 and 41. These are in your cross-references, by the way, for those who get it. And Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 13, is, you'll also read about it. So it's not always the same amount of, of water or wine. Uh, sometimes it's a third or a fourth or a half part of a hen, depending on the scriptures that you're reading. That could be anywhere from one and a half to three quarts. But it was more than just a cup of water. Now, David poured out a glass. I don't know how much they brought to him, but you know they brought for him to drink personally. But in these offerings, it could even be up to three quarts of wine, water, whatever's being poured out. Wine was the fruit of the land. So when um, Yaakov put wine on it, also here we see, we see it referred to specifically. It was in essence dedicating the land back to God. You brought the fruit from the land, I'm giving it back to you. So it was just dedicating it all and pouring it out in a symbol of consecrating. You know, just giving it all is all, it's all God's and honoring him with it. So that's what his intent and purpose here was with the altar, with the drink offering on it, um, and what all it said. And I'm trying to get back to, maybe because I'm there and didn't realize. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to get back to verse uh, 16 now because we, we already talked about it being called Baal, the house of God. So verse 16, then they journeyed on from Baal, but, then, but when there was still some distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel, Rachel, began to give birth and she suffered severe difficulties in her labor. Okay, they journeyed. Jacob's on his way back to dwell near his father. Remember, he came back to the land he settled in Shechem for about 10 years, maybe a little bit more. They have a bad episode happen there. He's on his way over to, to Beth, Beit El. He's made the sacrifice. He's come back exactly where he promised God. If you take me out, you bring me back. I'll honor you. I'll tithe to you. I'll consecrate to you. You know, And he builds that altar again. He also, though, as the son of the birthright, is going to need to be in position to be taking care of the responsibilities that the son of the birthright would take care of, which is the household, the land, everything. So he needs to be back near his father. It could have been that he knew it's, it's time, dad's getting old, I need to be there, and, you know, and where is he going to settle now? God uprooted him from Shechem, and he's moving on down. It could have been, but remember, the nurse, uh, Deborah King, the one that was close to his mom. It could have been her influence. Remember, she was in the house of Isaac. And she'd come to stay with Jacob. Maybe she encouraged him, look, you know, it's time. Your dad's getting old. He needs you to be around. You need to be taking your responsibility. For whatever reason, we don't know. But his leaving was not against what we read in verse 1. Long time ago, so skip back up to verse 1, and you'll read there with me. Then um, God said to Yaakov, arise, go up to Baal and live there. Um, you might have dwell there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. Okay, that's what he heard. That's what got him to move and got him to come. But the idea behind those Hebrew words are not go live there permanently. It was that he was to go with his whole family. He was to dwell there long enough to build an altar, to make this dedication to the Lord, to hear what the Lord wanted him to do. But there's nothing in the Hebrew that's saying that he's disobedient moving on. El probably, like even today, wasn't exactly the place where, you know, the, the it wouldn't be where the flocks could be fed all the time and where they could settle. They needed to come a little closer to Beersheba, to Hebron, to Hebron, to where his father had already established. Um, so it, it's just, it doesn't, it didn't have to be a permanent abode, but he needed to go and stay there long enough to perform his vow and to have his family with him because the family was to join in. He's the spiritual leader. And remember, he had them clean up everything. They got rid of the idols. They cleaned their clothes before they went on and made this, this altar to the Lord. So he's come, you know, Full circle, he's back where he's supposed to be, and he's not in the wrong to now journey on down toward what ends up being toward his father. 
So uh, going back to verse 16, they journeyed on from Beit El, but when there was still some distance to go, there was a little way to go. Hebrew says there was some length of land. Uh, they came to Ephrath. Okay, now our maps don't show it. We've got all kinds of competition today. I'll let the big truck get by. Okay, uh, I'm not going to take you back to the map, but just know that, that Bethlehem is six miles south of Jerusalem. Okay, so if you remember Bethel, Jerusalem. Do I have it the wrong direction? No, I'm sure I've got it the right way. No. Yeah, Jerusalem's on the bottom, Bethel's on top. Yeah. Okay. Bethel is about 15, 16 miles from Jerusalem. Let me give you that, okay? Then, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting myself a turn around. I may need to get, you have you get me a map back up. Give me the modern <laughs> map. Give me map number three. And okay. I think in that I can get it straight. So I tell, I don't want to confuse everybody else. Uh, when you work with the old and the new, you sometimes... <laughs> <laughs> okay, do we have, does it show it? Hebron uh, is further up from going up from Beth Hill. Yeah, yes. Um, so if we're coming down, we're going to come to to Bethel first mm -hmm. before we come to Jerusalem and when we're about five miles from Jerusalem, <laughs> we're, gonna, we're going to be at Bethlehem. Okay, we lost it. It's okay, Roger. It's okay. Yeah, really. I think we've got it straight in our minds now. So anyway, they're coming near Bethlehem. Beit Lechem is the way we say it in our Hebrew. Ephrath means fruitful or fruitfulness. Um, you wait, hear wait. it pronounced today even a fraught. It, it didn't get on. It restarted and closed your mic up. Sorry, folks. Start back from your fraught. Okay. Yeah. E Ephrath. Yeah. Okay, and we've got noise out there too, plus I understand my mic went off and came back on without me touching it, so sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me start again then. They're, they're going some distance. They're traveling south. They're going down. We've got Bethel. They're headed toward Jerusalem. They're going to come to Bethlehem. Um, Bethlehem is about five, six miles outside of Jerusalem. I know that I say more than that later, but I'm not finding my notes yeah. right now. So good enough for the moment. Um, Bethlehem Beit Lechem in Hebrew means that, um, well, Bethlehem means the house of bread. Ephrat or Ephrata, if you say it in the English, Ephrat means fruitful or fruitfulness. When you have a house of bread, it's the supply. Bread is the sustenance that you need for life. It doesn't mean that it's fruit like an apple or an orange, but it, it's fruit in that it's, it's satisfying, it's a blessing, it's the Lord restoring to you. In this case, it's showing a communion with God, a place where you can be nourished and satisfied in your heart. So the good name, good name, and we know what happens in Beit Lechem, the one who is the bread of life, is born in the 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 house of bread and definitely on purpose i think does verse 19 say something about it no it just says that on the way to ephrat that is bethlehem they give it the full name because there's another bethlehem that you don't hear much about on the map but they make it very specific because of having two with such a close name but it's interesting that in the prophecy in Micha, Micah, chapter 5 and verse 2, it makes it very clear that it's Bethlehem Ephrata, or, or Beit Lechem Ephrat, if I'm saying it in my Hebrew, that that's the one that would see the one who was from of old born new, that, that he would be ancient of days, but he would be born in uh, Bethlehem, in Beit Lechem. Okay, here's where my note is. Okay. Bethlehem is about 15 to 16 miles from Bethel and about two miles from where Bethlehem is on your maps today, but I don't have one showing Bethlehem. But Beth, Bethel, Beit El, and Bethlehem, Beit Lechem, are very close to each other. Okay, so you saw where Beit El is, just know Bethlehem's not far from there at all. So, um, Jacob has started out, do we have a map problem? <laughs> yes. Okay. 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 See, I have Bethlehem down here somewhere. I just lost it. Okay. There's Bethany. Yeah, okay, down here. 
Bethlehem. Uh huh. Okay. Where's the other Bethlehem? Okay. Is it that one over there? The the other you Is mean it down here? You mean the one you were talking about? That that's not very talked about. It's not even on this map. Oh. Yeah, the okay. only one on this is the one that where Yeshua yeah, Jesus was something. born. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, and I'm trying to find to give you the reference. The see, point. this is the one that they started from, right, Ephraim? Oh, they start from Baal, Baal. Uh -huh. which is up yeah, in here, and I don't see it named, uh, but it would be yeah, in this area. Yeah, totally that gray is yeah, hard. Yeah. Yeah. Does that say Bethel? I think so. Okay, okay. And then Bethlehem. So see, there you go. And that would fit. That's where we're coming. Okay. And here's Jerusalem. So, you know, and I, I do, I've got to stand corrected. And I knew I was right in the first place and I should have trusted me. Bethlehem is south of Jerusalem. So they're going from Baal through where Jerusalem be down to Beth Bethlehem. Okay. Because they're headed down to Hebron, which is this area. Here's Beersheba. Here's Hebron. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're headed here. Okay, next time I thought I did enough with the, the maps, but Roger, when you're back, put up the newest map, the third map. Thank you. Perfect. But for those that are wondering, and while he's calling up my third map, we're coming down south. Up here we've got um, Beth Baal, Bethel, where he's just done the, the building of the altar. He's going on down south to Hebron, 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 okay, for you guys. Before he gets there, he's passed through where we know Jerusalem is today, and just south of Jerusalem, about five miles south, is Bethlehem. That's where Rachel's going to die. So, okay, here we go, here we go. So, um, get rid of that bar, thank you. Okay, remember Beit El was up near the area where it says West Bank? Okay, now see where Jerusalem is? Can you mark Jerusalem? There we go. Okay, there's Jerusalem. So he's come down past there. He's going to come down to Bethlehem, which is just south of Jerusalem. And he's headed straight on down to where it says Beersheba. Beersheba? Yeah. That and Hebron are next door to each other. So that's where he's headed. That's where Isaac's living. Okay, down in Hebron, which is right there with Beersheba. But on the way down, after they've passed through where Jerusalem will be, they've come to uh, Bethlehem, and that's where Rachel's going to die. Okay, about six miles south of Jerusalem, and about 10, 15 miles down from Beit El, where he started. Okay, uh, and you got to remember, they're not they're not driving in cars, and they're not flying in airplanes. They're they're on their feet. They've got a caravan. They've got all kinds of flocks and all. They're not moving fast, but uh, they're far enough down that, that they're away from where they've been, and Rachel's gone into labor, okay? Uh, yeah, you can see Hebron is a little higher than Beersheba, so, but really they're very close today, so I put them close. So Joseph, yeah. never mind. <laughs> yeah, we're not, we're not to Joseph yet. <laughs> well, Joseph has been born. I, I mean Benjamin. Yeah, that's, that's where we're coming, okay? So, again, I think I've got it um, short distance from where the soul was restored to communion with God and then to Bethlehem where he would be nourished in the, by the, the meaning of the names. But uh, just before we get to the sad point, and very often God will bring us into a strong place spiritually before we go into a trial or a tribulation that's going to be very deep and very hard. So as if, you know, because God knows he can prepare and get us ready for it. But to this point, we see a bit of a revival for Yaakov, for Jacob. Um, if we go back to chapter 34, verses 30 and 31, where we left off, the incident in Shechem has happened now. The boys have killed off the men, and, and Jacob's upset because they're all going to come after him. In that, though, in, in the raping of Dina, in not taking steps, all that, that happened, you could call that gross iniquity. You could call it a disgrace. You could call that, you know, now he's acting out of fear. We've got to leave because we don't know what's going to happen. All of that. Well, usually for revival to come, there's something like that first. There's a gross sin. There's a, an iniquity. There's a fearfulness going on. Then by God's word, there's a change that's made. 
Remember I took you up to verse 1? God told Jacob when he's trying to figure out, what do I do now here in Shechem because I'm afraid they're going to come against me. God told him, go to Baal. God sent him on where he was supposed to be. So verse 1, we see that, that by the initiation of God's word, we're going to see a revival. We're going to see a change. Then we saw in verses 2 and 3 in this chapter, they got prepared for it. And you have to be prepared for the presence of God in the sense you can't, you can't be sitting in it and then jump into the presence of God and think everything's fine. God's going to clean house. <laughs> we see that happen in, in verses 2 and 3 where they get rid of the idols, the, the, um, the earrings that were amulets for the idol worshiping. They had to change their ways. They cleaned their clothes on the outside to show that they were wanting to be cleaned on the inside. So we see to come into that revival, forsaking anything that's displeasing to God, getting it out of the house, changing our ways, coming into that full obedience to God where he can reveal his complete will to us. Verse 3, we see that Yaakov did this remembering past blessings. He says in verse 3, um, Let's arise, go up to Bethel, make an altar to God who answered me on the day of my distress, distress sorry, and has been with me wherever I've gone. So he's cleaned up, he's, he's turned from the, the wrong ways, he's cleaned up, he's coming back and recalling the blessings of the Lord. That's encouraging, let's get back into the house of the Lord. Um, I'm not going to use names, but a pastor very near and dear to all of our hearts will tell you about his times of rebellion. And he will tell you that every time he got away from the Lord, he quit going to the house of the Lord, and he'd get himself into problems and issues and messes, and then he'd realize, I've got to get back. And when he'd get back, he'd come back recalling and remembering it was good in the house of the Lord. And that's basically what we're seeing here. It's good to come back and get right and be in right fellowship and receive the blessings from the Lord. So what are the results of turning back to the Lord? And my encouragement to people who think that they don't want to come back because of fear of judgment, God brings us in. He's a forgiving and a loving God. He's a God of the second chances. He does not say, no, I don't want you back. He always, he's the father looking for the prodigal son. Always, you know, looking for the one to come. And when you come back, when you turn back, then he, Jacob's going to come into a time again where he's protected even from his physical enemies. Remember, he's sure that Shechem, that the people from the other communities around that were allied with Shechem are going to want to kill Jacob and his sons now. But verse 5 tells us that as they started out on their journey to go to Baal, that there was a great terror on the cities which were around them, so they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. They would have come after them. They would have caught them in the hills, and they would have killed them. It would have been the end of our, our family line to the Messiah. But God protected them because they were coming one. back this chapter, 35. So they're coming back into that right place, the right mm -hmm. fellowship with God. And now the emphasis is not on Jacob. Go back. Okay. Yeah, in chapter 35. We're, we're staying in all in 35. We're just moving up to the verses we've come through and seeing this overall picture. So when we look in verse 7 on chapter 35, we have there where he built the altar where God had revealed himself to him when he fled. We see again that he is recognizing God's the one who's blessing me. God is the one who's taking care of me. And as we come into recognizing everything, all the blessing, everything, and that's from the hand of God, we're now coming into, instead of the focus being on anything else, it's on God. And we're, we're seeing a new character develop. Yaakov got a new name. He's now called Israel. It's, it's to show the contrast that when he's walking in the newness of the spiritual life, he has that spiritual name, that roller with God, and all else that we saw that the name meant, which was a, an intimate fellowship and relationship between a father and son even. So now we've got a new life. It's characterized by a new walk, a spiritual walk, and there's a new revelation of the character of God that's given. We see that in verse 11. 
where he introduces to Jacob himself as El Shaddai, as God Almighty, the one that, that is going to cause him to be fruitful, going to cause nations to come from him and kings to come from him and land to be given to him. So it's a new revelation of the character of God that's given. It's like, wow, what a God he has come into relationship with, an almighty God who is going to enable him to walk right before his God, to walk in the newness of life, to walk spiritually. We know that we're told by Shaul Paul that, that there's a constant battle between the spirit and the flesh. But the one you feed is the one that, that will win. If you feed the flesh, you're going to act fleshly. If you feed the spirit, you're going to walk in the spirit. You're going to walk into that fellowship and the blessings of Almighty God. And that's what happens when we come into that fellowship. We see in verses 12 through 14 that there's a time when we worship God. Yaakov made the altar to worship and to have fellowship with his God. The one that, that promised him all these blessings, the one who took care of him, he's recognizing and he's honoring him. And there's even fellowship with others too. He's got his whole family there that he's brought into uh, fellowship with God. So we see him move into fellowship restored now, where he was out, now he is into that fellowship restored. So we see an order here. The blessings are promised. We worship and honor and recognize they come from our God, and we come into a fellowship that is restored. And again, God's bringing him into a good place with him, an intimate place with God. He's strengthening him in his spiritual walk because he knows what Jacob's about to literally walk through. And very often, God does prepare us for a, a testing that's coming that's a great sorrow or a hardship. He very often will look back and will say, wow, I just got this from God and it prepared me for what I was going to go through. So that's what I believe we're seeing here in verse 17. As we go on, we have that it is talking about Rachel. Verse 16 tells us she was suffering severely in labor. Verse 17, and when she was suffering severe difficulties in her labor, it's repeated again. The midwife said to her, do not fear, for you have another son. Okay, Rachel, Rachel could have been getting along in years. She wasn't a spring chicken. Um, they've been married 29, 30 years by this point. Jacob is 105 at this point, or approximately, you know, we're close. So Rachel probably was a little older, and childbirth was very difficult. It could be what took her in childbirth. I say that because there are those out there who want to say that because Jacob condemned the one who had the idols to death, that here's the result. Really? It took God, what, 10 to 15 years to have what Jacob said happen. I don't, I don't see a delay that way in what in God's dealing. Nor do I see man's ability to choose the timing of, of people's death. So God had ordained the days of Rachel. I see this also in the story of, um, oh goodness, uh, the one who they, they, the argument is whether he sacrificed his daughter or not. All I can think of is Jabez. I've got the wrong name. Yeah. Um, no, it, and it wasn't Jabez. It, it, sorry, it'll come back to me in a moment, I hope. Anyway, he had said he'd had this great victory, and he'd said on his way back to the house, and he just said it quickly, kind of like David did with, I wish I had some water from that well. He said, the first thing that comes out of my house, I'm going to sacrifice it to the Lord because he'd been given this great victory. And unfortunately, it was his daughter that came out of the house. His the first that daughter. came out, his only daughter, yes. And so the controversy is, did he offer her in sacrifice? No, no. God never wants human sacrifice. The only sacrifice ever was what God gave, and that was himself. He sacrificed himself, but he never asked us for human sacrifice. He gave life and brought life out of death, and brought it abundantly. But what happened is she was given unto the Lord, tongue in cheek, like a nun today. I say tongue in cheek because she didn't go into a monk and become a, a there was no Catholic religion or anything then. But she dedicated her entire life to the Lord's service. That meant she would not get married. She would not have children. He would have no grandchildren because of giving this up. 
so she willingly she goes out for a couple of months bemoans her her, her virginity which means she went and played and had fun mm -hmm. but she knew I can't get serious with someone I, I'm not going to enter into a relationship. But she spent a little time just kind of adjusting to the fact that, yes, I'm going to honor my father's words and I'm going to give my life in fullness to the Lord. And that's what she did. So he lost all the, the carrying on of a family name, everything stopped there. I like the way you, you explain that. A lot of people trip on it. Give me the name. Jephthah. Jephthah. Thank you. Jephthah. Thank you. And give me the scripture. I knew it was a J. <laughs> yeah. I just couldn't get out of Jabez. That's all I had in my mind. <laughs> It, it is very controversial, very hard for people to understand, but when you get into the Hebrew and when you see it, you know God God didn't even let Abraham uh, offer up Isaac. He let him think he was to do it, but he stopped yeah. it. Judges 11. Judges 11. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All oh, comes rushing back now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for okay. doing my finger work and helping my poor little peon brain. Mm -hmm. but, um, but 11. Chapter 11. Just yeah. start reading because it's a story. Oh, so sorry. Sorry. I've read it. Okay. <laughs> okay, what woman were we talking about? Jephthah's daughter was who came out of the house, and he had said, whatever comes out of the house first, I'll sacrifice. <coughs> so it was just, it was a rash comment. Mm -hmm. oh. He just meant, you know, anything I got, my whole house, I just give it to the Lord. But, and the Lord held him to the fact that, that she's going to honor me in, in her service, and he gave up the, the blessings in the, in the natural. A family and um, so, but who is all he? That he's Jacob's son? No, 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 no relation. Well, somewhere they're, he, they're related, Jacob's but <laughs> it's it's much later. But I brought it out because there are people who say that Rachel lost her life in childbirth because Jacob had declared whoever's the owner of the idols should be put to death, not knowing that Rachel had hidden the idols, oh, you know, from her dad. Oh, yeah. So there are those that say, "Here's the judgment," and I'm saying, oh. "Really, really." You know, that many years later, suddenly the gauntlet falls from Jacob's words. No, I don't, I don't buy that at all. We do need to be careful what we say, what comes out of our mouth. Blessing and curse both yes. should not come out of the mouth. Blessing only should come out. We should realize that our words have impact. But we do not overrule God. And we do not have the ability to take life. We can't say to someone, you, you should die, and then they die. That's not given to us. That's in God's control. And that's why I do not go there. But why I bring it out here is both times I do not see it in that way. And like you said, I've been telling a lot of my uh, sisters and clients, your words does matter. Your words count either way. It's how you put the word in your heart and believe. And what you say does come to pass. And Life what comes out, out of the heart, that. the mouth speaks. Yeah. But when you say sticks and stones can hurt your bones, and it can break your bones, but words will never hurt you. <clears throat> no, words. words hurt. Yeah. <laughs> words yeah. hurt. You can build people up and you can crush people by your yeah, words. By your so, words. And yeah. that's why I really believe strongly with your healing. You can confess the word because it's God's word. Even, even if you don't feel good. You can still say, but Lord, you said I'm healed. No matter how I feel, I'm taking your word, your word, by my words, I believe. And basically you your words are showing a total yieldedness for God to work through you. Yeah. And that's where you want to be. So yes, you need to be very, very careful with your words. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, um, for whatever reason, whether it was, oh, I'm sorry, Maria, yes? Sometimes you have to really flag yeah. me down. Well, yeah, <clears throat> it is what we, what, what it comes to our mouth, yes. But also, when we make a vow to the Lord, we are to fulfill that vow. True, true. That's what it is. And, that, and, and I think this is what we see in here, that what he said on sacrifice, not that he was going to kill somebody, but he just didn't even think maybe he thought that maybe the animal will come out I don't right know. right but who knows what but he it was, was thinking yeah exactly but he did he sacrificed whatever the sentence that, that he may have from from that from that daughter and it was the only daughter <clears throat> right so, right yes yeah. 
So, yeah, yeah and it, very it, good it, point. When we make a vow, a promise to the Lord, we are to fulfill it, whether, you know, it hurts or it doesn't. And, and yes, and very good point, because too often we'll make a vow to the Lord in the midst of a hard time. I hear people all the time, if the Lord gets me out of this, I'll serve him all my days, or I'll give him this, or I'll do that. And then as soon as it gets over, they, you know, for a little while maybe they do, but then they go back to this whatever, you know. No, we should, if we make a vow to the Lord... We should keep it 100%, and we do need to be careful what we say and what we vow, that we can follow right. through, that right. we are, you know, obedient to keep our vows before the Lord. All those are good lessons for us to learn from it. Yeah. But uh, anyway, sadly, oh. his beloved wife, oh. Rachel, <laughs> sorry, we've got... <laughs> we really want something. We've got it. Oh, the cat. That, that was? That's your dog. Yeah, but I was talking about Rowena once. Oh, Rowena, you want? Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I thought you were just telling me. Never year. mind. <laughs> go right ahead, Rowena. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Help her. There we go. I was just trying to clarify. You said that there was a at least 15 years lapse from the time they left uh, uh, Laban's place to. Where, where do we see that one? To this time that she was uh, in labor? Because it took them time to go from. Um, from Padan Arm to, to the area that they settled in, the area of Shechem, we'll just call it Shechem. Remember that Laban came behind and he caught up with them because he could move faster. So we know it was just a limited bit, bit of time. But we know that then Jacob settled there. He didn't keep going. He didn't go down to Beersheba, or actually, I'm sorry, let's say to Beit El. He didn't go there. He settled for a while. Remember we talked about whether it was because it was too hard with the little ones to be traveling, whether it was because they had nicer um, fields to feed the flocks there for whatever reasons. He settled and he stayed there long enough that Dina... Dinah, who was probably, if I remember right, five or six when they left Padan Aram, was old enough to have been in the position of being raped and the, the mm -hmm. being wanted to be taken in marriage. Um, remember the one that raped her wanted to marry her. So she wasn't a child. She was old enough, you know, to be married. Probably something like 15, 14, 15, 16. Because, they, yes, they did marry much younger than us. Uh, in our day and age, but she definitely was not a little child. Time had passed. I think we saw other reasons that I'm not recalling right now that showed time had passed. Then Jacob finally does move from Shechem down to Beit El on his way to Hebron. He's not quite there yet, but that's why I gave it an approximate. You know, we don't know exactly how many years took place. 10, 11, 12 years in Shechem, we really don't know. So from the time he set out to the time he gets to Beit El was definitely well over 10, less than 15. So I kind of just settled on 12 in the middle, just an approximate. Okay. No, because uh, for the first time I'm hearing this one because uh, I always thought that what happened to Rachel was uh, like the curse that came out from the mouth of um, the, the husband when they were leaving, when, when she didn't want to go down on her, right. on her uh, camel or wherever she was riding because she was sitting on the idols of her father. Right, actually she'd so. taken the, the saddle that they sit on, we call it a saddle, into her tent. And when her father came in to search her tent, the idols were in it because they could put the blankets, they could put all kinds of things in that, what sat on the camel that she they sat on. on it, so. She was sitting on it and saying, it's a time, a women's time on me so that he wouldn't make her get up. And he searched the tent all around her and didn't find them. So yes, and then that's where Yaakov was so upset about it that he made that, that rash statement, you know, we don't have your idols, and if you find them here, whoever you know stole them, that one should should die. You know, mm -hmm. he had no idea that his Rachel had done it. He didn't even know it that day. He didn't know it until later, mm -hmm. when it is revealed that there's idolatry that needs to be cleaned out. But there are, as you said, there are many that say that because Jacob said that, that's why Rachel died in childbirth. But it's so much time later. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got we've got time here. We're going to see. Um, you know, that Joseph has had a chance to get a little bit older. He, he and, and Benjamin weren't a year or two apart in age. I'm trying to remember if I know exactly, but when he's 30, 
I think we've got enough proof to say Benjamin's like 12. You know, he's young enough, he stayed at home with his father when the older brothers went off to get food in Egypt. You know, we have to realize there is a time lapse in there. And I don't believe that, that God finally decided, oh, now this day, because Jacob said it here. Even with Jephthah, there was a little bit of time. She went out and bemoaned her, her virginity, the fact she wasn't going to marry, but it was still... It was known, it was, you know, they, it, it was for a little bit of time and then this happened. And I do not believe that God held Jacob's statement to fact. He wasn't vowing that to God, you know. He was just making a statement to Laban, to Levant, you know. And so I don't believe that it was something God had to hold him to and, and say that. I mean, many times, you know, if that be true, then mm -hmm. Abraham should have suffered death for letting Sarah go off into the um, harem of the king of Egypt or pharaoh of Egypt, whatever I should call him. You know, because he, he said she's my half-sister, then she should, he should live by that the rest of his life. And Isaac with Rebecca, you know, it, God isn't holding us in that way. Is it right for us to say things half-truths and to not, you know, no. And should we be careful what we say that comes out of our mouth so that we don't get held to do something that we don't want to do? Yes, all of that I agree with totally. But I don't agree with her death in childbirth being because Jacob made that comment to Levon, you know, I don't I'm just, I can't see that, well, personal I think, opinion. I think also, you know, God saw his heart and what he said in Iraq, God didn't take it serious what he said because he didn't mean. Ex he exactly, did. exactly. David didn't mean literally go get me that water. He didn't even realize his men were hearing and they were going to take that kind of action, you know, we have to understand. and. Um, a note that I had from one of my sources that I cannot prove or disprove, but I tend to agree. We don't know, but they could have been in uh, Shechem, in that area, long enough that that's where Rachel um, became pregnant with Benjamin, that she can see Benjamin in that area. You know, and still she's coming to full term to deliver this baby nine months later from whenever, wherever they were when they conceived. You know, we get in our mindsets, we can go down to San Diego and back in the day. You know, we can go up to Northern California and, and back, you know, literally in the same day if we want. It's a long day, but we can do it. Yeah, or, or less, you know. Um, you can get to Sacramento in less than eight hours, and then you come back down. That's 16 in 24 hours. Yeah, you could have had it just as long there to play as you did in the driving in one way or the other. So I'm just showing us time lapse in here, that, that it took more time than what we are seeing. And uh, um, I tend to think it was more her age, her health. You know, um, again, God ordained her days on this earth before she was ever born. So it happened in his timing, not because of the comment from um, Jacob. There's another way where I see people just really malign his character. And honestly, as I study different sources and, and read different things in relation to Genesis right now, I've come into it in, in more times than not where people that I even respect in their Bible teaching will suddenly come out with these really what leads to anti-Semitic, you know, remarks. And I know they don't mean it that way, but they're certainly, you know, the way they slander his character, they certainly are coming out with that. So... Uh, not that this is slanderous of his character, but I don't, again, just concluding it, I don't believe that her death was because of what Jacob said. I think it was just God's timing, and this, this was when it took place. He brought Jacob into a place close to him, in right fellowship with him, because he's going to go through the heartbreak of his life. This was his beloved wife, the one that, that he loved so much, he worked 14 years for her. And, you know, did seven and did another seven um, just to have her. When it says in the Hebrew um, that the midwife said to her, and I want to get it um, exactly, do not fear for you have another son. When we read it in the Hebrew, it's this also is a son for you. Or in essence, you have another son. Let's go back to Joseph's birth. And when Joseph was born, her desire was 
added me another one, Lord, and his name meant Addie. You know, she got one and she wanted another one. And the midwife obviously knew her heart's desire was to have more children. And so she was letting her know in her last moments of life, you have another son. God had heard your cry. God answered your cry. God gave you another son. Sadly, though, she doesn't get to stay around to raise that child. But it was chapter 30 and verse 24, if you want to look for her cry, you know, to the Lord to, to conceive again. And she did get to uh, conceive this one and name him because she knows that, that she is dying. It says in verse 18, it came about as her soul was departing, for she died, that she named him Ben-Ani. But his father called him Benjamin. Now Ben Ani means son of my sorrow or son of my pain. And that's why she expressed that. But Jacob didn't want his son sentenced with that negative for life. That would have been a hard, you know, name for him. Every time somebody is calling him that, be reminded that he was his mother's sorrow. He was his mother's pain. So he named him son of my right hand. Rachel was like his right hand, his completer in, in that marriage relationship. So he renamed him Benjamin, son of my right hand. In the naming of this child, in those two names, we see a foreshadow or a picture of our Messiah. Let me show you how. Go with me to Luke chapter 2. To who? Luke. Oh. Luke 2. Okay. We're going to go to Luke 2, uh, 34. We'll read 34 and we'll read 35. Luke 2, verses 34 and 35, where we read, And Shimon, Simeon, bless them. This is um, the parents of Yeshua, Miriam and Yosef, Mary and Joseph. They're, they brought baby Yeshua to the temple. Um, this is what they were to do on eighth day. It's, it's the day of circumcision, etc. But um, Simon as you guys would call him, who was uh, in, in the temple area. Um, God had promised him he would not die before he saw the redemption, the Messiah of Israel. And when they brought him in, God let him know in his spirit, this is the child. So he saw that he blessed them, blessed Mary and Joseph. And then he said to Mary, to Miriam, his, the mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. What he was telling her is this one is for the rising and the fall and the salvation of Israel for those who will be saved. And you, your own soul, Mary, is going to be pierced through. Even that hearts are, uh, uh, can be revealed. The heart is what God judges to see who has accepted his salvation and who has not. So something that was going to happen with this son who is going to be the revealer of the hearts, the one who would raise Israel up, something was going to absolutely pierce Mary's heart. What would that be? Crucifixion. Exactly. Crucifixion watching her son be crucified. I cannot imagine the agony of her soul on that day. And when Yeshua was on the cross, the agony for him, seeing his mother suffer with his pain and agony, and Yochanan John, his beloved disciple, was right there. And, you know, remember the eldest son is responsible for the mother. She's widowed, and we believe that Mary was widowed because... We don't read anything about the earthly father that was not involved in conception, but was his father. So we believe that out of that silence, he, had, he was out of the picture. He had died by this point. So here he's got the responsibility of the oldest son to be caring for his, his mother, and he should be seeing to her in her death, and instead she's watching him die, going through that agony. And he turned to, to John, you know, I mean, he's on the cross, but he looked at John, and he said to them, you know, woman, behold your son, and son, behold your mother. John, step in, take care of her for me. And we know he was the tender and the loving uh, disciple out of all. So what, what perfect one for the Lord to choose to put an arm around his mother.
but that piercing of the soul had to be that day of crucifixion. How sad, son of my sorrow, son of my pain. Yet, we also see son of my right hand. Now go with me to Acts chapter 2, verses 34 to 36. So, it's just a different book and almost the same verses, chapter and verses. Acts 2, 34 to 36. And here we read, and this is when Pentecost takes place in this chapter. And uh, the Holy Spirit's, you know, falling on them. They're seeing and hearing, you know, the, all the manifestations that are taking place. This is after the resurrection and ascension of Yeshua back into heaven. And verse 34 says, for, was, for it was not David who ascended into heaven. David is the one who declares this, and this is Psalm 110. But David didn't do it. He wasn't speaking of himself. He says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Adonai and Jehovah are the two lords in here. David was king, and he was looked at as the Lord, but he was prophesying in that psalm. He was looking to that day when Jehovah was saying to Adonai, God the Father saying to God the Son, sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And we know that's where he is right now, that when he entered into heaven after the, the earthly life, ascended back into heaven, very shortly after that, he is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Revelation shows us that. We see the throne with the Son sitting at the, the right hand of the Father and hear those words again, until I make your enemies your footstool. And this is what happens in the, in the uh, Battle of Armageddon when all are put under his feet and he comes back and rules and reigns on earth as well as in heaven. Um, and verse 36, just to sum it all up clearly, therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, Yeshua, has made him both Lord and Messiah, both Adonai and Messiah, this Yeshua, this Jesus whom you crucified. He is both Lord God and he is the crucified Yeshua Jesus and he is the resurrected and he's at the right hand of the Father. So, son of my right hand, he is the son of God at the right hand of Jehovah the Father waiting for the enemies to be put under his feet for good. We can't hardly wait. So, beautiful portrayal of Messiah, of Yeshua Jesus in both his, um, his uh, what's the word I want? His first coming and his second coming. Okay, first coming he comes and it, it's the suffering, second coming it's the ruling and reigning because he is the one equal on the throne with God. The right hand of God is a place of strength. We see that association with strength all the way through scripture. I want to take you all the way back to Shemot, to Exodus chapter 15. This is the battle cry that the Maccabees used when they uh, were victorious over Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, picture the Antichrist and the, the power of God over the Antichrist even. But rather than to, you know, stay on that, let me just bring out my point. Verse 6, your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. Notice how that right hand is associated with power, with the strength, the right hand of the Lord. Psalm, Tehillim, Psalm 16 and verse 8. Psalm 16 and verse 8. Okay, come on, tablet. There we go. You'll get there before me, but I'll be right there. Psalm 16 and verse 8, where we read, I have set the Lord continually before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Again, right hand strength. Go to Psalm 63 and verse 8. 63 and verse 8. Psalm 63, 8. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Psalm 138 and verse 7. Are you getting the, the picture? <laughs> Psalm 138 and verse 7, where we read, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch forth your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. 
That's a good verse to quote when you're in the midst of a trial. The right hand of God will save you. It's also a place of honor. Look with me at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. Colossians 3 and verse 1, Therefore, if you've been raised up with Messiah, with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Messiah is seated at the right hand of God. So I took you to Revelation for it before. Here it's in Colossians, and that's the honored seat, the right hand. And that, that we even saw in his earthly life, too, when the Talmudim wanted to sit you know, in the, the seat of respect. It was the right hand of the one that, that is the head. So again, we have both advents, that's the word I wanted earlier. We have the suffering servant born in Beit Lechem, Bethlehem, house of bread. And we have the victorious king coming back to rule in righteousness, Lord of Lord and King of Kings, that's now at the right hand of the Father. So again, to call the son Benoni, the, the son of my sorrow, all his lifetime would have been so difficult and so hard and so sad. And yet, the name that, that Jacob gave him without even realizing, it was to show that honored position, that position of strength to complete the picture. Yes, Messiah came humble. Yes, he suffered. Yes, he was the servant. Yes, he shed his life. But yes, he resurrected. Yes, he is alive. Yes, it is resurrection power that even gives to us today that at his right hand we are strengthened, come through our battles, see him at the right hand of the Father, and one day we'll see that literally in heaven and on earth. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. Love the picture. Okay, comments, questions, are we good? Okay, we'll go just a little bit further then. We are traveling. We're traveling about the pace they traveled. <laughs> slow. <laughs> slow. <laughs> but we're making progress. You know, I mean, look at we're in, we're almost in chapter 36. We're two thirds of the way through Genesis. We we do get there eventually. <laughs> Verse 19. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrat, that is Bethlehem, Beit Lechem, because remember they called it one and the same Ephrat or or Bethlehem was the same um, interchangeable at that time. For us today, Beit Lechem is the name that's taken predominance, but again, one's fruitfulness and one's house of bread, and we see the relation of the two. So she was buried about two miles north of Bethlehem. Uh, today, it's the outskirts of Jerusalem, about five miles south of Jerusalem. You know, remember, they came down past where Jerusalem would have been, but it wasn't the capital city at that time. So they came on down. And Jerusalem develops later um, from what we read in Scripture. But uh, um, And let me read the rest and then I'll make my comment. Verse 20, And Yaakov, Jacob, set up a memorial stone over her grave. That is the memorial stone of Rachel's grave to this day. Then Israel journeyed on. Well, before I get 21, let me stop with 20, okay? Um, it's very interesting. He made a memorial. He made a landmark. It was still there to given to this day. That would be an editorial note. And if Moshe, Moses, is the one who was putting this together, as we believe, then it, he's saying, even in Moshe's day, here's Jacob and Rachel. We've made it all the way down now. And even in Moshe's day, after we've gone through 400 years of time in Egypt and come out and we you know, are, are in the promised land or coming into the promised land, I should say, because Moses didn't get into the promised land, you know, but he brought them through. Year, hundreds of years later, they still knew. The marker was still there to this day. They knew where Rachel's tomb was. Now let me take you to 1 Samuel, 1 Shmuel, chapter 10. Oops, I don't want to do it there. I want to do it on this one. I don't want to lose my place in Genesis. 1 Samuel chapter 10 and remember Benjamin is her son okay the son she gave birth to and died but he's still her son first Samuel 10 and verse 2 says when you go for me today then you will find two men close to Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin in the territory of Benjamin as Zelza and then it goes on and it says so Benjamin's territory was marked one of the, the, the markers of it was Rachel's tomb. 
you know, they didn't have roads and say, you know, from Waterman to Sierra Way, you know, to Highland and 40th Street, but they would use geographical marks. And one of the marks for Benjamin's property was Rachel's tomb. Fitting, because he's her son. <laughs> anyway, just an interesting note, but here's my point in bringing this out. We see that this happened with Yaakov. We see in Moses' day, they still knew where it was. We see when they get into the promised land, the land's been divided among the 12 tribes. It's a marker for Benjamin's land. We can go further on. I have stood inside Rachel's, the, the, what they've built over her tomb. It's a place where Jewish women love to go to pray, to have good childbirth, <laughs> because you know they feel her heart and her cry. But it's also an area that the Muslims targeted and built a Muslim, whatever, you know, place of, I don't know if I can call it a place of worship, but a Muslim hold at one point also. Now, the Muslim religion began between the 6th and 7th century AD. Well, We're talking 600s. They, they would take that spot knowing it was the Israel's... Because they wanted to erase anything that had to do with Israel, anything Jewish, and claim it was theirs and that they were there first. Now, Rachel was, what, how many hundred years B.C.? We're at um, probably close to 3,000 B.C. still. Um, I know that Moshe takes them in, gets them ready to go in the Promised Land at about 1445. You've got 400 years, 1800, let's just say 2,000 B.C., Okay, approximate for Rachel. So 2,700 years later, the Muslim religion starts and builds something. It is absolutely ridiculous to say they were here first. But this is what's still going on today and what the Arab nations are trying to do today when they declare the Jews weren't there. Jerusalem didn't belong to David. He didn't buy it from the Jebusite. And then they find coins and, and so forth that established it at 1000 B.C. And their claim has to be 1,700 years after that at the earliest or even later, even more modern times. God does not allow it. Archaeology continues to prove this land is the land that God gave to the Jewish nation. And he gave it forever. So I'm sorry, they, I'm not sorry, but they need to get over it. <laughs> <laughs> they need to realize the argument is with God, not with man and not with man's territories and man's markers. But God has shown the continuity. God has shown who it belongs to. And every once in a while you get these little gems. They just came out with something else in archaeology. I saw the headline. I've got to go read it, and I'm trying to remember. I only saw it this morning. But I think it's from Solomon's time. It's something else that they've just found. Stay tuned. I'll bring you out an archaeological report soon. But you can Google, you know, archaeological findings, you know, current findings in Israel. And it's amazing. But, but God has his name on that country. And that's who they're coming up against. And, you know, really with, with Hamas today trying to declare it and trying to say that, that or not Hamas saying it, but the world saying to Israel right now, you have to make a two-state. You have to, you know, how, how they expect them to do that with terrorists who have just massacred their land. How they can expect them to sit down and say, oh, okay, now it's okay for you to live in my backyard. Really? What, who of us would do that? Would the United States do that if someone came in and killed off half of California? Would the, the rest just say, oh, okay, it's your land now? No. No, we would not. We would come against that. But there's nothing new under the sun, and they're continuing to do the same thing. And we're not going to get to it today, but in my study I had in Genesis, we're going to see a time that, in fact, as soon as we get through chapter 35, and we're almost there, chapter 36 gives us Esau's descendants. We know that Esau is called Edom, so we know it's the line of the Edomites. We know that we don't see the Edomites today. Now the land called Edom, we still know where it is, and it's still in prophecy. We see the scripture that's yet to be fulfilled. We do see scripture having been fulfilled, though, where God took um, offense at the Edomites. One of the things he took offense at was when they rejoiced when Israel was massacred. And I thought to myself, whoa, all you people who rejoiced at Hamas's massacre on October 7th, God saw that. God takes offense to that. And if he wiped out a whole people for that, 
look out, look out. You are tangling with God, and you're tangling with the apple in his eye, and God will. It may not be today, but God will defend his people and his land, and those innocent he saw, and he knew every one of them that lost their life. It's like that big meeting for all the countries and all of them were there, and the leader that was coming against, he said, Mala you know, is going to take over Israel, and all of a sudden he was struck down with a heart attack and died. Mm. <laughs> Everybody okay. would just, uh, 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 okay. uh, uh. Yeah. yeah, be careful when you come against God. Be careful. And it is not a uh, anger, it's, it's a righteous judgment, yeah. you know, righteous, righteous wrath, and God will have the final word. We won't get into that today because I see, let me see if I can get us to a closing point right here because I see our time has gone. But chapter 36, we'll probably move through kind of quickly. It's, it's a tongue twister with the names, um, but I'll give you why we study it. There is a reason why we need to know why it was included in the Word of God. You know, nothing's here for no reason. But I think for today, what we'll do, in fact, it'll be a good setup for next time to come together. Um, we'll finish with verse 21. I'll explain that. Then we see the 12 sons named in the rest of our chapter. That's the heritage of Jacob. Then we'll look at Esau's descendants and why we study it, what we pull out of chapter 36. And then we'll be um, into chapter 37 before we know it. 37 is going to introduce us to Yosef. He's going to have grown up to be about 17 years of age, and his life is amazing in Scripture. There's so much in there, more than just what's at face value. So we've got some exciting times coming, but let me go ahead and do verse 21 real quickly just to, to finish our complete thought here. Then Israel, notice he's being called Israel. He's gone through the death of his, his beloved. I showed you how God brought him into close, intimate fellowship with him before he faced that. He comes through that with his spiritual name. Then Israel journeyed on, and he pitched his tent beyond the tower of Idar, or you might even have the word Migdal. Migdal is the Hebrew word for tower, so if you're, the English is saying that, it's the watchtower for the flocks. It would have been a place where they were able to watch over the flocks and protect them from robbers. So again, it was a landmark, and they knew where that was at that time, and so the, the commentary for us is that Israel, who is Jacob, has traveled past that point now. He's gone uh, pitched his tent beyond that point. Remember, he was in transition. He only stops at, at Beit Lechem because of Rachel's death and stayed there, I'm sure, long enough for mourning to take place because they had their time of mourning. And then he keeps on moving because what he's really doing is he's coming down to his father's house. He's going to be back where Isaac is, Yitzhak. He's going to be there because in time he's going to take over completely because Yitzhak is going to die. Um, in fact, I think he dies before this chapter ends. Does he not? Yes, he does. Okay. It's coming right up then. Um, I studied ahead, and that's why I can't remember sometimes where it's at. But um, we're definitely moving. He's, he's come back to where God wanted him to be. He's in position to take over spiritually and to follow through. So it's just showing us that, that he, again, he didn't stay in Bethlehem after losing Rachel. He mourns for her, but he moves on down. He continues on, and he'll come um, into um, Isaac's area and live close by. And that also is where we're going to see in chapter 36, where does Esau live? Where has he been living, and where does he end up living? And how does that you know, all happen? That's 36 will be a great transitional chapter. Like I say, it won't take us as long to get through it because it's not as much you know, to... Uh, be in the detail, but uh, yes, yeah, verse 27, very next, no, we're not to 27 yet, we're close. Anyway, anyway, we'll find out what happens with Reuben. Just because the father's right spiritually doesn't mean all the kids are doing right. So we've got a real family, we've got real, you know, ups and downs and, and good times and sad times, but uh, 
what we can learn and take away and what we can have in the midst of our trials and especially in this to if you've found yourself in a position where you do not feel that you are in that right fellowship with with the lord i encourage you get back in because there's blessing there's protection there's security there's an enablement to go through the trials of life because we all are either going into a trial in a trial or coming out of a trial <laughs> as just called life <laughs> I didn't put it that way originally but it resonated and I've never forgotten it so mm -hmm. wherever you are on that may you know the blessing of fellowship with the Lord to get you through it to see and know his will and his way and I think we've learned today too we need to be careful what we say we want to be honoring to our Lord with everything that comes out of our mouths and uh, we should never be one that has both blessing and cursing come out of the mouth. The scripture is very clear about that. The, both should not proceed out of the same mouth. So let's have clean mouths and a clean heart before our God. We have to gargle and we have a clean mouth for sure. You might need a gargle. You might need to get rid of those idols. You might need to clean your clothes. <laughs> but, but let the Lord clean the inside. Remember those days. Yes. Yeah, yeah, there were days I wasn't even gargling it with a bar of soap yeah. <laughs> to clean my your one mouth. Son, my one son got it a lot. <laughs> oh dear. So yeah. you attempted to show him physically, clearly. Yes, stubbornness. Oh, Lord, mercy. <laughs> That's the stubbornness has to be channeled to be stubborn for the Lord, not against the Lord. But for some it's more of a challenge than others. <laughs> and yet the Lord loves us all through it and knows how to bring us through. So let's close in a word of prayer, then comments, questions, whatever you have to say. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for blessing us with it. We thank you for the example set before us in it. May we learn all that you would have us to learn from it this very day. May those who are in a troubled spot be able to glean from this your presence and be encouraged. You will bring them through this trial. You will bring them through victoriously. That it doesn't stay at ben me. It doesn't stay at a point of sorrow. That it turns to Benjamin, the son of my right hand, where it is righteous rule and it is joy forevermore lord how we thank you that even though we feel time here on earth is long this is the short with the sin and our eternity is forever with no sin no death no bad mouths no no rebellious hearts just joy in your presence adoring you and serving you pleasing you and basking in your light uh, can we go now, Lord? <laughs> We're ready, but let us stay another day to win another soul to you. In Jesus' name, amen.